in a new series. Uh, actually, we're still in the book of Ephesians, but now the Apostle Paul gets into spiritual warfare. So what we've done, we've kind of packaged this as another series within a series. It's like a dream within the dream. It's almost like that movie, uh, whatever it was called, with Tim, uh, whatever, what's the name of that movie again? The Dream Within a Dream? Inception. Inception. Thank you. You guys are a bunch of heathens. See, I, I'm so spiritual. I don't even, I just heard about it. But this is a series within a series, and we've been talking about it, and the Apostle Paul is writing to a church in Ephesus. Ephesus is a, a society that is, you think our society is crazy. It was crazy back in those days. There was all kind of witchcraft going on. There was prostitution was everywhere. Violence was everywhere. Uh, the church was going through a hard time. Uh, the church of its day was going through a hard time. The Jewish believers were going through a hard time. The new Gentile believers were going through a hard time. And so if you think we have bad government now, imagine having an emperor that could kill you at any moment without having a, uh, having a court of law. If you were Jewish, you could be thrown in prison without even having a trial. If you're a Roman citizen, you had more rights. It was a difficult time to live in. And there was a, a church was at odds with each other. So, uh, and I used to think this. I was talking to someone the other day to say, you know what? I, I just don't like church because... The Christians, well, everybody, all you have to do, I used to feel the same way until I read the Bible and I realized, wait a minute here, there's been problems in the church all these years. That's right. So we serve a perfect Savior, not a perfect people. So we're all a piece of work. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right. So we're talking about the SWAT, spiritual warfare and tactics. We are at war. If you don't recognize it, I'm surprised you don't. How many folks ever feel like you're kind of coming against something that's beyond Right? It's, it's, some of you say, I'm married to one. No, 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 no. <laughs> but maybe you feel like, what is going on here? There's something lurking in the dark. What's going on here? What, what is this battle I'm facing? It's just beyond. This is beyond. And I think all we need to do, everybody, is see what's going on in the latest headlines in the last three weeks. Yeah. Last month has been unbelievable, all the things we've seen. From what happened up in Maine, what's happening in the Middle East, We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But all these horrible things going on, and, and it's obvious there's evil out there. It's evil. And so we find ourselves in a land full of violence and evil. What are we to do? And maybe you, even in the way to church this morning, got in a huge argument. I don't know if you did or not, but I, I, I've had some of the worst arguments, not in my, not my household, but... Growing up, and my dad was a pastor, and we had some of the worst arguments before we came to church. And so we've seen the enemy comes against us in many ways. And so we're going to be talking about that today. But I did hear people say this, well, the devil's against me. The devil's against me here. And the, oh, how are you doing? Well, the devil. And every time I talk to him, I hear about the devil. I said, I'm not asking about the devil. I'm asking about you. I had deviled eggs. They were bad. Oh, <laughs> Why do they call them deviled eggs? Actually, I kind of like them. Anyhow, but that's the only devil I like. But seriously, I mean, some people often say the devil's coming after me. Listen, I, as much as I love you and I do, I frankly don't think the devil is going to go after you. He's got more important people to go after, like uh, Vladimir Putin, like President Joe Biden, like the House and the Laos, all that, you're right? So the enemy goes after those folks. I don't think the enemy has time for you and I. And by the way, we're going to get into a few moments. We have an enemy out there. And, and, he's, and he's not omnipresent. He can only be at one place at one time, but we're going to talk about it in a few moments. You'll see as we talk about it. Okay, so empowered warriors understanding spiritual warfare. If you don't know you're being under attack, if you're not aware of the playing field or the battlefield, you can be taken advantage of and suffer problems. So we're going to look at today, how do we overcome spiritually? So spiritual warfare is real and you are in the battle like it or not. Like it or not, you and I are in a battle. So what are we going to do? Are we going to fight against the wrong enemy? Or are we going to find out what the real battle is and not waste our energy and waste our time fighting against things that prevent us from doing the right thing? And think about it for a moment. If you have a battle and you can get the, you get the platoon and the different parts of the, if the army fighting against the Navy and the Navy fighting against the Marines, what's going to happen? What's going to happen if you have all these different people not communicating? It's going to be chaos in the field. So the enemy does everything he can to create division. Divide and what? Conquer. That's what he tries to do. So we're in a battle. It's not a mistake what you're going through. We're going to look at it 
in a few moments. I like what Tony Evans said. He said this, spiritual warfare, good definition. Spiritual warfare is that cosmic conflict in the invisible angelic realm that is being waged in the context of the visible physical realm. Uh, what basically is going on right now, if I were to grab my phone, I, there's a bunch of microwaves, there's cell signals, there's Wi-Fi signals going through the air. I can't see it. I can't feel it. Some of you think you can feel the waves. I can't feel it. But what I can do is go like this, and immediately I can go on the internet because it's right around us. At the same level, there are things in the spiritual realm you cannot see, but it's there anyhow. It's like being in the ocean, if you will, where you have wind. You can't see the wind, but you can feel it. And many of us can feel the evil and feel God in different circumstances. So let's get right into it. The Apostle Paul is chained to a Roman guard. He's coming to the end of his letter. He's imprisoned, and he's writing letters, and he's dictating letters to different churches. And right, probably about six or seven feet from him is a Roman guard he's chained to. And he's going to talk about Roman armament and what it means to be a spiritual armor. And I, I have a sneaky suspicion he's looking at the guy right there. Well, there's no one here, but you know what I'm saying. Pastor, are you seeing things? No, I'm just giving an illustration. Okay. So I'm sure he saw him right there, and he actually dictated his letters so the Roman guards would hear him preach. And I bet we're going to look at how you and I can have victory spiritually. How you and I can have victory. So finally it says this. Finally, that means he's coming to the end of the sermon. By the way, he's still got a ways to go. So I, I feel good about myself because usually when I say finally, there's two more points. In fact, the Apostle Paul prayed, preached so long, people fell asleep and fell out of the window. And one the guy even died and he came back to life. That, aren't you glad we have one level here at Cornerstone Church just to make sure <laughs> if anyone falls asleep? <laughs> okay. Finally, be strong in the Lord. What it's saying there, be strong in the Lord, it doesn't say, hey, Get your act together, go to the gym, work out. No, he's saying, no, I want you to be strong in the Lord, not in yourself, but in the Lord. Well, how do you do that? I want you to imagine with me for a few moments that you're, a, you're on a sailboat. And on that sailboat, you are completely dependent on the wind to give you propulsion. So what do you have to do in a sailboat? You have to raise the mass. You have to raise what? The, the, the sail, and the sail has to catch the wind. So you have to navigate, and you have to catch the invisible wind. You have to feel it and sense it. And that's why the Bible often calls the Holy Spirit a breath of God, almost like the wind of the Spirit. And so what you and I need to do is catch the Spirit in the sails of faith and navigate it, and by looking at our operational manual and our love letter from God, we can see where to go on the charts, and we begin to pull in the faith and harness the wind, and you and I get propulsion. It's the Spirit that drives us forward. So when it says, be strong in the Lord, it's not saying going, <laughs> no, it's saying, catch the wind. Be strong in the Lord. And that's why the Apostle Paul could say, when I am weak, then he is strong. So what it's all about, everybody, sensing the Lord, knowing how to catch the wind of the Spirit. Be strong in the Lord and in the what? Strength of his might. Not just my might, but his might. And that's why, that's why God can work so powerfully, no matter who you are, no matter what you've been. If you're submitted to God, and you open your sails and let the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his spirit, fill your sails. God can propel anybody into his purposes. So if only be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. So put on the armor of God. What's that? We talked about it. We're going to go through all the different armaments, by the way. And it's fascinating how these things are a protective mechanism that you and I can win the battle. And so how do you put on the armor of God? You put it on by prayer. And there was a, there was a time I actually prayed for six months. I would go through this cha chapter. I put, on the, I put on the belt of truth. I would put on every part of the armor. Lord God, I choose to walk in the truth today. We're going to teach you how to dress yourself for battle. So you're going to get out there and you're going to be able to take a bullet and you're going to have the Kevlar of the Holy Spirit and God's armament upon you to protect you that you are an overcomer in Christ. Whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the secret tactics of the enemy. 
He's like a terrorist. He doesn't have a, you can't just go to his country. He's a terrorist. It's like Hamas. He hides. He's a coward. He'll hide behind things and he'll try to infiltrate and he'll, it's hard to get him because he's a terrorist because he knows he's outnumbered. Okay? So we be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And there is a devil out there. We're going to look at it in a few moments. Here's more an explanation as we move forward. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, wrestling was very common in the Roman era. They had these games where the guys would wrestle. And when you're wrestling someone, what happens? You're in close proximity. There is a battle going on. And sometimes it's tiring. Have you ever felt like you're wrestling something? I felt like I was wrestling. It was a time I was wrestling fear and depression. Man, it just came on me. I had to wrestle that sucker and battled and battled and battled and battled and battled it. And so sometimes we go through that. We wrestle through all sorts of things. We feel this wrestling, right? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And so, you, you know, your enemy, your wife is not your enemy. Your parents are not your enemy. Even your boss is not your enemy. And so look at your neighbor and say, you're not my enemy. And tell them, sometimes you are. No, I'm just kidding. No one tells those One of the things my wife and I learned at a marriage conference is said, look at your neighbor, look at your wife, and say, you're not my enemy. So the enemy tries to get us to fight other things. If he can get us to shoot at other targets, or he can get us to box at shadows. So you can spend your life, you're trying to beat this thing. I can't beat this because we keep on swinging at shadows. What we want to do is truly see what's going on and give an uppercut into the jaw of evil. And the only way you can do that is by the Spirit of God. Well, you and I can have power over the enemy. And you and I can learn to do this in the Spirit of God. That's what we're going to be doing in this series. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against of rulers, against of the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, what's this all about? There is a spiritual hierarchy. The enemy is a defeated foe. He's got a short period of time. He's a dictator. He's an evil emperor, and he has different lesions of angels of different things. I believe there's a department of of brokenness, of family brokenness. There's a department of broken sexuality. There's a, a department of violence and anger. You name it. There's, I'm telling you right now, the enemy has different categories. And I doubt very highly the enemy ever, Satan ever bothered with me. But I believe we've dealt with some situations that he tried to get my family on in the past. And I have to make sure I don't allow the enemy to have a foothold in my life. Okay? And so I'm getting a little scared now. Well, hang on a few moments. The Bible says, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. So the enemy is a defeated foe, but he is like a cornered rat. He knows his time is short. So there's all sorts of different principalities out there that go over various things. And I could tell you a a lot more things. You might think I'm a little spooky by saying this, but sometimes my wife and I, we can sense stuff. Like one time we were at a, we were in Columbia and we walked into this flea market and I just felt, I said, honey, I just feel like a weight I, I just feel it really heavy. She said, so do I. And sure enough, there was a bunch of cultic things right on the corner of the store. And sometimes I'll sense things. Of, I see dead people. No, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> but we're, we're going to stick to the scriptures, okay? But I'm just going to tell you, there is something out there. In, in our Western mindset, we don't understand the spiritual as much as much of people in the East, different parts of the world. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said the following, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist who believes there's nothing spiritual or a, magic, a magician with the same delight. So there are people out there, I, I, every time I talk to them, I go to a prayer meeting, and it's like we're praying to the devil. Oh, God, you know the devil's got me here, and the devil's got me there, and Satan did this, and Satan did that, Satan did this. Whatever you focus upon, you will drive towards. And so the best way to, to, to defeat an enemy is to look at the solution, and when he gets in the way, take him out. We don't sit there looking around all the time. How are you supposed to score if all you're looking is for the enemy? 
Where's the enemy? Where's the enemy? Where is he? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be aggressive, and I want to score. I want to pass. I want to take that football, and I'm going to run across the football field. I'm going to look out for the enemy, but my job is not to hit the enemy. My job is to score a touchdown in Jesus' name. And so that's what we do. We score in the name of the Lord. And when the ones come there, we have linebackers. We can knock them down. But our objective, imagine a guy at the football going like this. There's an enemy. There's an enemy. You're going all over the place, right? And you get nothing. Your job is to do the will of God. And when the enemy gets in the way, you, you, you kind of pivot and you run, you knock them down, and you get through the end zone. And so we're just, thank God there's no football games right now because you guys wouldn't be here. Okay, too fun. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in the battle, like it or not. You and I are in a battle. That's why it's important for us to get connected. That's why today at 1 o'clock we have Pro Track. You can come and be a part of this church. You can find out if this is the right place for you to be, and you and I can join together. I am so encouraged when I see the church gathering together, fighting for each other in Jesus' name. I love it when I see how you guys have rallied around different people in this church. And it, it happens organically without me even trying. It, it, it's beautiful when I see that. It's like coming home and the kids have mowed the lawn, dusted, made a surf and turf dinner with New England clam chowder that doesn't have any sand in it. Imagine that. And that's what I feel like when I see you guys walking together in a battle, battling for each other, helping each other out. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in the battle, like it or not. And that's why we are encouraging the men to become warriors in their house. Pastor, that's a shameless plug. You bet it is. <laughs> and the reason it is for, it's time for the men to stand up, guys. We need the men to be strong. Some of you have, some of you have safes where you put guns. Well, you need to take out the big guns. And the big guns is being men of faith and strong. So I want to encourage you with that. It's going to be an amazing time with Pastor Steve Holt. He's a great guy. He's an author, speaker. And we're going to get into what it means that we're at war. That's the topic. We're at war. How do you get power for the war? And how do you put a team together to fight? Listen, everybody. Sometimes you need somebody to come alongside. And let's take out their sucker together. Let's join arms, right? And warriors focus. So I want to encourage you guys. It's going to be amazing. If you can't afford it, Pastor Rennie will write you a check. But uh, <laughs> thanks to the gift today. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But all kidding aside, uh, we want to encourage you to come. If you can't afford it, just do what you can. And you're welcome to come. And, and we made it kosher. We're going, to roast, we're going to have a pig. All right. Praise the Lord. See, we, the devil's a pig. That's where we're going to eat him. See? All right. Okay. Thank you. Spiritual warfare is real, and you are in the battle, and God all-powerful, and it's over, the, God is all-powerful and over the devil. They're not equal. They're not a yin and a yang. God is more powerful than the enemy. That Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Listen, everybody, his time is short, and, and the devil is created. He's in rebellion, but everything he does, I don't like this, and, and this is a theological uh, issue we have to work through, and I do, and I have, and I continue to, but everything has to go through God first. So listen, everybody, we can have victory over the enemy. He is not over it. However, the enemy can get power if we give it to him. That's the problem. Your head's not going to spin. You're not going to throw a pea soup, okay? There's not going to be some demons flying. I mean, the devil doesn't come around that way. He comes around very crafty. His biggest weapon is secrecy. His biggest weapon is to infiltrate. Jesus cast out more demons in synagogues and the temple than he ever did outside. So, yeah, he did that. So how do we do it? Well, the Bible is very clear of how the power and strength we have in him. In Ephesians 1.3, we begin this book. The Apostle Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, you are seated with Christ on high. We went through this when we went through Ephesians. And Ephesians 3.10 says this, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That the church together, when you and I join together, we can do great exploits against the enemy and advance the kingdom of God to 
together. That's how we can do that. And the battleground is the flesh, the world, and the devil. These are the things we're, we're fighting. We fight ourselves, right? For example, you may have, maybe you have a, a hunger, and so you'd like to overeat, and, that's what, and maybe, that, maybe you, after the service you go out there, instead of having one donut, you open your purse or your bag, and you throw a bunch of donuts in there. And then the kids come out of children's church, and they're crying to mom and dad, where's my donut? And you're the one. Okay? So the bread of ground is the flesh. We have fleshy desires. And these desires are exaggerated and are used in the wrong capacity to bring us damage. And so we fight against the flesh. We also fight against the world, right? The world system. The, the, the world. Listen, everybody, you have to understand, you have secondhand smoke of the world gets on you. And you come home and you don't realize it. You got something, you smell like the world. I remember going to concerts in the 1980s when they used to have smoke. I came back, my leather jacket smelled like smoke. I had to put it on the porch and take a shower because the smoke was all over me. And so we have to be careful that we wash off ourselves in the power of the word to make sure the stink of the world does not get on us. We become immune and become indifferent towards sin. And this can begin to happen. So the battleground is the flesh, the world, and there is a devil that comes against us. And we have to say, be gone in the name of Jesus. And you can see the power we can have. We can pray for each other, and you can actually have authority over the enemy in your life. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it says this. And you were dead in your trespasses in which you once walked, following the course of this, what? World, there's the world. Following the prince, that's the devil, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body. So right there, I just showed you the world, the flesh, and the devil. Right in there, those are the battlefields. But we have power over the enemy. Spiritual warfare is a battle waged most often in our minds. This is the front lines. This is the front lines. If the enemy can get you to think something and believe it and ingest it, if it can get your conscious mind to your unconscious mind, now we've had you working on your unconscious as well. And so what you and I have to do is take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. We have to grab that sucker like a big bouncer, like in a, in a bar. Of course, we don't go to bars, but we like a big bouncer, pick up that, that thought in Jesus' name. Yeah. Whew, get out in Jesus' name. And just because you think something doesn't mean it comes through. You're not going to be able to make it. I'm not going to be able to make it. No, in Jesus' name, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can't help yourself. You have this addiction. No, I can. No temptation has overtaken me. What is common to man, and God is faithful, will not allow me to be tempted beyond what I'm able. But with every temptation, will provide an avenue of escape. And right now, my wife just called. There's my avenue of escape in Jesus' name. Right? You got to say it. And sometimes I've done this. I've in Jesus. I actually. T I looked at myself in the mirror. Says, "You can do this, Eric. Through Christ, I will actually yell at myself." People think I'm crazy. Spiritual warfare is a battle waged most often in our minds if you get us to believe a lie. Yep. It's like this, everybody. I don't like mice. I hate mice. I think, I think the devil's a mouse. <laughs> it's annoying, right? So I had this expensive club cup cadet in my, garage, in, my, in my shed, and these mice came in. And they came in. I have an environmentally friendly uh, uh, lawnmower that has like this plant-based coating on the wires. And the mice love it. The old-fashioned ones were made out of oil, and they don't touch that one. And so they went in my air cleaner. They got everywhere. They destroyed my lawnmower. Okay? I don't like mice. Okay. So anyhow, so what happens in your house if you leave the door open? Right now, it's cold outside, baby. It's cold, right? And so they get in a little hole like this. They can squeeze in. And if you're not careful, you leave a trash can open. The mice will come in the house. And if you don't close the door, the Bible says be angry, but do not sin and give the devil a foothold. We can give the devil a foothold by having unforgiveness, by allowing ourselves to do things we shouldn't be doing, and the enemy gets in. Then the enemy likes to have babies, right? You know, they start to, like roaches and rodents that get in the house. So what happens is we need to make sure that we do not allow it in there. I know a lot of people that try to cast out the flesh. You can't cast out the flesh, but nor can you disciple a demon. Sometimes we have to, in Jesus' name, cleanse ourselves and get people to help us with that process as well. But 
The power primarily is right here in your mind. Make no mistake about it. Getting you to believe lies is the biggest tactic he has. He's called the father of lies, and Jesus calls him the father of lies. There's no truth in him, and that's what he does. And when you and I believe lies, and they're telling us lies over and over and over. In Nazi Germany, they had a minister of propaganda. Get them to believe, say it, say it, say it, say it, say it, and you start believing it. Lies are his power. So how do we confront the enemy? We confront the enemy with what? Truth. And who's truth? Jesus Christ is truth. And so in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says this. Satan, who is the God of this world. Yes, he is. He's God of this world. Has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message is about the glory of Christ. That's why when you pray for somebody, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now that you would poke a hole in the heavens, that the light of your glory would come upon my family member, that they would see the truth in Jesus' name. And so we work. We, we're ground troops, everybody. Our primary function and our primary authority is based where God places us. Our primary function is on this celestial plane. And this is where we have the power. We call the Air Force, but we're not flying airplanes in the heavens. We're ground forces. We call them in. In Jesus' name, drop a bomb over here. Give me the coordinates, right? So we focus on that, but we work in with God. I know some people get carried away. We're on the, the army. They're like, I want to fly a plane. So they sit there and close their eyes and imagine they're in the heavenlies. That's a waste of time. Just pray for a situation. The enemy's fine with you wasting your time working in a territory that's not yours. If you're in the army, you're not in the Air Force. Okay, so, but we pray. Okay, so Satan is blind to their minds. That's what he's done. So I wanted to show you some of this blinding of the minds. You're getting political. No, I'm getting biblical. This is a lie. This is, what they're, this is what they're telling you. They're telling you that Palestinians, and by the way, we love the Palestinians, and by the way, Palestine was given by the Rome when, uh, when Israel was, was, was torn apart in 70 AD to, to shame the Jews. The Romans called them Palestinians. So we love the Arab people, okay? And so this is what they'd have you believe. They have you believe they own the whole thing. And then in 1947, Israel came in and drove them out. And in the 67 war, they did drove them out again. And this is where they are now. That's what they would tell you. That's a lie. This is the truth. They were under the Ottoman Empire, and then Britain had them. And then after they were slaughtered and baked in ovens, six million of them. Then, where are they supposed to go? And so, a nation was born in one day, in 1948. And they became a nation. And what has happened is, you have the, we have the, those non-Jewish people, there are little spaces that they have now. But it's a lie that they were there to, in the beginning and they owned the whole country. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Hamas in the, in the Hebrew means violence. And they are over Gaza. Okay? So what are they supposed to do? Do you know what they did to the Jewish people? They raped the women, broke their pelvises, chopped babies' heads off. Don't talk about that. We need to talk about it. Put people in ovens. The Jewish people have not received this kind of violence and this atrocity since World War II. And what is happening as a result of all this? There are lies going across the world where we see in Washington, D.C., just yesterday, tens of thousands of people saying, get out to the river, to the sea, drive them out. And, people, and, and, and we're, we're being fooled by these people. No justice, no peace, Right? From the river to the sea, and these people are deceived. Now, there's a demonic attack. So, what do we do? We got to pray that God opens their minds, and we got to pray that God brings the Jewish people to their Messiah, Jesus. But we can't allow lies to take place. Okay, we're running out of time here, but I want to let you know that, okay? So, the biggest trick is to fight the wrong battle. I want to conclude with this the enemy does everything he can to get us to fight against each other. So he can, he can get us from doing damage upon his kingdom in the world. I've seen more church splits. He'll try to get you to rebel against God. Then he'll try to destroy your family. If he gets you to destroy your family and you fight against your spouse and your kids, then you can't be much of use. And if that doesn't work, he tries to get churches to fight with each other inside. Okay, we got to focus on the absolutes and not get tricked in these various things. And Matthew 16, 23 says this. Do you realize that one moment Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. The next moment, Jesus said, I'm going to have to die. And Peter said, no, God forbid it. And look what Jesus says next. He said, he turned around and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. 
you are a hindrance to me. So one moment, if you're not careful, you can serve God. And the other moment, we'll be tricked by Satan and be used as a tool of evil. Even though you're not possessed, he can get us to be fooled about various things. That's what he can do. In 2 Timothy 2.23, I'm going to show you something here. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments. This is what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy. I don't know about you, but I'm not looking forward to 2024. Can you guys do me a favor? Let's not get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments. Can I hear an amen? amen. Gather the facts. Not from some dude on YouTube with a stethoscope around his neck. But, I mean, I, I even my parents said, can you believe this? It's just ABC News. It was a fake ABC News. Get the facts, right? I say, don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights, okay? A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, huh? <laughs> it's easy to be a jerk on social media, but you get in someone's face, you're like, then you're, not, then you're a wimp, right? But in social media, oh yeah, okay. Everyone, be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Can I hear an amen? Okay, there we go. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Now check this out, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. We see this in the church. I've been held captive by the devil at times. I've hated people in the previous churches I was involved with, and I was being puppeteered as the enemy was taking me charge. And I had to give it up in Jesus' name. Never forget, a number of years ago, I'll tell the story because I need to. I know we're running out of time, but make a long story short, I was very upset that a position was taken from me. I had a position in the church, and I was demoted. And I was upset, and I wanted to find something wrong with that person. That person doesn't belong to them. I tried to find, and I realized, and my wife said, hey, you got issues here. You have insecurities. Your, your, your confidence and your character and your identity is wrapped up in your position, not the Lord. So I had to repent in Jesus' name, and I thank God that it happened. I got free. But what I could have easily done is sabotage the person that had my position now because there was things in his life that were a mess, and I got them. No, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. But that's kind of what happens, everybody, right? we got to make sure we don't uh, let bitterness get in our lives. And here's a big one, unforgiveness. The enemy will play you like a fiddle in Georgia when he gets you to have unforgiveness. It's his biggest arsenal. It's the nuclear option. Let me get them to not forgive because the enemy will tell you things about forgiveness that are not true. He'll tell you that when you, when you forgive somebody, you're saying what they did was okay. No, it doesn't mean you're okay if you forgive somebody. But God forgave you, so we ought to forgive each other. The Bible says, be angry, do not sin, to give the devil an opportunity. And when you and I choose not to forgive, we give him an opportunity. The biggest trick is to fight the wrong battle. So we don't want to be outwitted by Satan, right? And this is what happens. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses or sins, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is what Jesus said. If you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. Then he goes on later on in another passage of Scripture, in Matthew 18, the passage about conflict. He says, listen, there was a guy that owned the king millions of dollars. He couldn't pay it. He swore, I'll pay it back. He says, no, no, you can't. I said, okay, I'll let you go. The same guy that was forgiven a debt he couldn't pay found someone to owe him a week's salary and choked his neck. Give it to me. When the king heard about it, you wicked servant, I gave you mercy. Could you not extend it to someone else? And so this is what begins to happen. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, which would be like demons, until he should pay the debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you who do not forgive your brother from your heart. Some of you are sick because you do not forgive. Some of you have heart problems. Now, I'm not saying every heart problem is the reason. I'm not saying arthritis all comes from us, but make no mistake about it. If you are holding regret in your life and you're holding unforgiveness, you could have mental disorders from it. Scientists and behavioral, behaviorists tell us today, sociologists will tell you, they'll tell you that, that hold, harboring unforgiveness does your, does your psyche damage. The reason why is you're not designed to hold unforgiveness. You do not have the psyche to handle it. You don't have the mental capacity to handle it, and the devil uses it all the time. 
You see, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you while you were still in your sins. God loved you so much that he came to earth. And the Bible says all of us are guilty, every one of us. There's not one of us that's righteous. And so when God forgave you of a debt you could not pay, how dare we not do it to somebody else? Now, when you forgive somebody, you're not saying what the other person did was correct. All you were doing is taking the hook out of your mouth. And we've done it. We said, Lord, you'd handle the situation. We've called the authorities on people because they've sinned, right? Some of you have been abused by your parents or uncles. Some of you have been sexually molested. And, and, and what, what the enemy wants you to do is hold on to that. Yes, turn them into the authorities. But in Jesus' name, I release this person to you. And I choose to forgive. And it sets you free. You see, forgiveness is when you set the prisoner free and you find out the prisoner is yourself. Not to forgive is like drinking arsenic and wanting the other person to get sick. The enemy's top tier tactic is to get you not to forgive.